it's always a privilege and an honor to uh, to share my heart with the church. And um, <clears throat> Pastor John's are uh, pretty large shoes, so I'm not going to try to fill his shoes. I'm pretty comfortable in my own shoes. So, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, here um, at the Oasis, um, I'm going to kind of echo what Pastor John's been teaching on restoration and God being a God of restoration, not a punitive damages, or God does not require a pound of flesh from you because he, you know, we've been preached that God gave, sacrificed Jesus, killed Jesus for you, and that's not what the scripture says. And I'm going to show you in a minute how that uh, takes place. Pastor John, Chicago, Jeremy's on business, so you guys are stuck with me. <laughs> so, uh, um, do we have any first-time visitors? Welcome, we're so glad you chose to be with us. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Well, if you have, uh, um, if anybody has given you a card, if you have the opportunity, thank you for doing that. Um, again, welcome to the Oasis of Light. Um, I'm going to continue what I've started, at, and hopefully one of these days I'm going to finish. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's nice to have more than one preacher so that you hear a different, uh, you know, get a different flavor of uh, the same message. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to... Um, you know, through the Holy Spirit, and I, I don't want anything to come from me. Um, and sometimes I'm not nervous talking in front of people. I've spoken in front of thousands of people, but at times my flesh gets nervous because it doesn't know what the spirit man's going to say. So, uh, you know, and I could feel, um, I'm pretty aware of how my body reacts. So right now I can tell you the flesh is really nervous. The spirit, is my, the spirit man is in control, and that's the way you ought to be, right? Yeah. So, um, how many of know the uh, the uh, scripture, John three sixteen? Everybody, right? We teach them as you know to the young kids through a song or through uh, poems, through verses, um, and it is a verse that that you know most people that minister to other people use that. Now, you know in the, the context of the verse, who is Jesus talking to when he quoted that verse? Nicodemus. He was talking to somebody that didn't know Jesus but had the desire. There was something on inside of him that said, I want something more out of life. There's something more to this. And he asked Jesus, how do I, how do I get saved, basically? And so Jesus said, you know, among other things, you know, to, to, the theme of this whole passage is to believe. And you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for whom ever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So I, medita I was meditating one morning, lay in bed. Um, I often wake up, I beat the alarm clock, so I'm just laying there and I just ask the Lord, you know, okay, what are you, what are you trying to tell me today? What do you have for me today? And this verse came to mind, and I was thinking, I was meditating on the verse. And Lord, if I were to explain this in the light of what I know now, based on the good news, we all know what the good news is, right? It's the finished work of Jesus Christ, and anyone that believes in that finished work, you know, shall be saved. It's restored, it's healed. So in that light of, of, of what we know now, what the good news is, is not our self-righteousness, it's the finished work of Jesus Christ. How do I look at this verse? So the Lord has kind of gave me this, and you know, and, and I know when I get this flow because just I see this. I don't know if you see those LED, you know, writings that just move from left to right or whatever, you know. I just see it like that. And I picked up the Bible, I went into the living room, and this is how I read it now in a different translation, which is uh we're not going to make it an official translation, but this is just the way I received it. So, if you have the Bible, look in your Bible. For God so loved everyone in the world that he provided together with and through Jesus a way for anyone in the world that accepts this act of love. It will be restored to the image and likeness of God for eternity. How does that sound? 
Is there any room for you to add anything? So, So, it's the act of love that motivated God to provide a way. He never sacrificed Jesus, although there's a lot of translation that talks about Jesus being a sacrificing, you know, a sacrifice for us. And to put it in human terms, when you separate yourself before you're born again, the only way Jesus or God could relate to you, it was through your flesh. Do you know how can you understand it? Because you weren't transformed yet. You were still you, like Nicodemus was himself, transformation hasn't taken place. So when the, the, the translations of the scripture talks about Jesus being a sacrifice or sacrificial lamb, uh, it was for our conscience to understand that there's an exchange. Something happened. There was an act of love, which God, you know, by giving and that's why I, I, to me, when I, when I started to understand it this way, John 3.16 will never be the same. Even though I've learned it as, you know, as a young boy, John 3.16, that was the verse, the golden verse to, to learn, right? Uh, For God so loved everyone in the world that he provided together with and through Jesus a way for anyone in the world that accepts this act of love, which believes, right? will be restored to the image and likeness of God for eternity. And then going further to read 17, Jesus felt like he needed to explain further to Nicodemus what he's talking about. It says, for God through this act of love never intended, never intended to condemn anyone. But if they accept this act of love, they'll be restored. Verse 18, he who accepts or believes this act of love is not condemned, but he who does not accept this act of love, it's condemned already. What that means is it's, it hasn't been, it's not changed, it's not being restored, it remains in a fallen state. That's what that means, it's condemned already. Not that God condemns anyone, we don't condemn anyone, there's just, there's just no transformation, nothing takes place. So, now having said this, I'm going to go back to my original teaching that I started talking about the nature of God. So I just wanted to, 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 to kind of start with this because here at the Oasis, we're not talking about God being an angry God that's waiting for you to make a mistake. And if you do, you know, or here at the Oasis, we don't teach that if you are going through circumstances or they, you suffer some consequences of your choice, it's any, you know, God is not the author of that. You know that, right? And if you don't know that, uh, I invite you to go and go online to the Oasis of Light.org and listen to the teachings of, Pastor, teachings of Pastor John. He explains it so eloquently that, you know, God is a God of restoration. His heart is to restore his creation back to the image and likeness. And I'm going to get to that in a minute here. Because in the beginning, and how many know that in the beginning, it's Genesis 1-1 as we know it, but that's not the beginning of God, <laughs> right? He existed for eternity. Amen. So if you remember the last time I talked to you here, I, I took you in your imagination way before the earth was created. And he, can you imagine what it must have been like when it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was this perfect love, this perfect circle of love. Everything that God creates, operates, and should operate based on the law of love. So when, when God sat there with the Son and the Holy Spirit, they created the angels. And if you have a good imagination, and that's why I love kids, you know, kids is use your imagination. 
you could probably imagine, you know, all these kind of call for sparks and, you know, all these, these you know, sounds and who knows. I mean, it's, it's, it was angelic. It was, you know, divine. And then, you know, Jesus looks at his daddy, looks at the father, said, this is a great thing. This is awesome. Then they created earth. So then after they created earth, they said, they let us, all three of them, the perfect triune, let us make men in our image and likeness. A lot of people focus so much on image, and I'm here to tell you the image, you never, nobody, nobody lost the image. Even when Adam fall, fell from the grace, he never lost the image. But the likeness was lost when he believed the lie of the devil that he's not like God. Fear creeped on, you know, in him, and he, you know, where there's perfect love casts out fear, right? So if there's perfect love, which Adam had because of God, he, made, he was made in the likeness of God, he lost that, that likeness, because fear entered his, his, uh, his being. So God's desire all along has been to restore men to that image and likeness. Is that pretty clear? Okay, so there's a, there's a verse in Psalms that says that men, without God's likeness, pretty much operates based on instinct, just like an animal. I mean, I'm not calling anybody animal. But the instinct to survive and to put yourself first, right? Me, 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 and look at the society they live in right now. It's just a bunch of narcissists everywhere. Okay, we raise them. And schools and everywhere, you know. I mean, they'll run you over to get to the, the head of the, uh, the line. Why? Because, you know, that instinct to survive is there. And, and unfortunately, you know, it shows that in people, and you see that in kids a lot. You know, like, man, they'll just get whatever they think is theirs. They'll just go get it. So when you accept Christ and you believe this act of love, that, you know, God, through Jesus, provided this way for you to be restored to his image and likeness. Okay? So God's heart has always been to restore mankind to the original design. I call that divine by design. Okay? That was the divine design that men be like God in image and likeness. So... Jesus' sacrifice, if you want to call it that. But the more we talk about this, you know, I, I, just, I just can't really, in my mind, I can't go there and call it a sacrifice. Although it was a sacrifice. He put us first, put, put us first before thinking what's going to happen to him. Now, who, who killed Jesus? We all know who killed Jesus, right? A bunch of people that are full of hate. God did not kill Jesus. You know, the hatred of people killed Jesus. Now, he allowed himself to be killed. And the analogy, if you're, if you're familiar with Taipan Shadow, the, uh, the, the brass serpent that was raised in the wilderness when the Israelites were bitten by, by snakes represents Jesus that was raised on the pole. You know, for us to accept that, to look at him, and to keep your eyes on Jesus, because the only way to... To, to, to retain that likeness is relationship, proximity to the source, which is God. You can't do it alone. It's called self-righteousness, and that's not good. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. You would think. <laughs> so, in the beginning was the love, and the love was with God, and I'm quoting John 1.1, 1, 1, Right? So, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was, God, was with God. God, if you, if you the, the, the scripture says that God is love, period. There's no other conditions. God is love. That's his nature and that's who he is. Amen. Okay? So, in the beginning was love, and the love was with God, and the love was God. That, that was what the beginning. So, in the beginning, that is, from eternity past, the Word was with God, and you heard me talk about, you know, that we are in the now. 
in the relation to the, uh, to the spiritual realm, there's no time and space, okay? So we always, in the now, but when you talk about eternity, which we could talk about eternity past or eternity future, so if you, if you hear me refer to that, it doesn't mean that I'm contradicting myself because we're in a now, uh, but to relate to, to us, to what we're talking about in this realm, in this physical realm, we do talk about eternity past, now, or eternity future. So, contrary to what's uh, supposed by some, it's not that Christ was not with God, because we said, you know, what about Jesus? And the point that I'm trying to, gonna, I'm trying to get to is that, that uh, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, they're one. And you, you saw the illustration the passage on had with three chairs, okay? There are other given, other worry in it, and you're sitting right in the midst of that. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, right? Amen. Just, you know, as Jesus is, so are we, for, uh, 1 John 4, 17. So, God was always, Jesus was always there with God. Everything that God has done, Jesus was part of it. Everything that Jesus does, God is part of it. Everything the Holy Spirit does, they're all part of it. And you can't, God does not do anything that says, you know what, Jesus, you turn, look the other way, I'm going to do something here, I don't want you to know about it. It doesn't work like that. You know, they are one. When you talk about, you know, the Trinity, they are one. So God provided a way for us to be restored through and with Jesus. And Jesus is not like, you know what, man, I have to do this. I hate to do this, but I have to do it because, you know, I promise you I'll do it. As, I don't think it's been that case. That's the case. Uh, I don't think Jesus was sitting there and said, you know what, I have a bucket list, and one of the things is, you know, to die for humanity. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus wasn't sitting there, you know, like, uh, you know, with the drink in his head, you know, like, I don't know what to do. He's pacing back and forth. Although we're looking at, you know, in the garden, he said, you know, Father, if it's possible, any way possible. And, you know, we, we constantly reason and we look at those scriptures as, you know, like, we were one of him. Like, what would Jesus do for, you know, if it was me? What would I be if I'd be Jesus? Well, Jesus is on the inside of you, but you're not Jesus. He lives on the inside of you. Okay, the Holy Spirit talks to you, guides you. So uh, Jesus was sitting there debating. It was just something that God and Jesus, their heart was the same. The same motivation that motivated God to provide this way motivated Jesus to say, you know what, I'm going. And if you, if you want to take it even further is, Jesus was hanging on a cross. God was there on that cross with them. And again, we're going back to say, oh, but what did the Bible says? You know, like, my God, my God, how, why have you forsaken me? See, it seems like, you know, the, the, script, the Bible is contradicting itself. And it's not the case. Because you got to look at it from the eternal perspective. You got to look at it from God's point of view, not our point of view. You know, you all heard that song, What If God Is One Of Us? Then God is no one of us. <laughs> you know? God is love. His nature is love. His motivation for everything he does is love. Amen. And love is, is not selfish. It's selfless. Mm -hmm. You know, he put our, you know, so I made men. He could have said, you know what? Redo. He will probably hit a button, redo, and, and we wouldn't even know. We would have been his perfect beings, you know, like, man, it's always been like that. And the Bible would have said, you know, God made us perfect and we lived happily ever after. But, you know, God could have done that, right? He's God. Amen. He could have just hit reset, reboot, and you know what? Forget the scratch, this Adam, you know, and it'll make a new Adam, an Eve. But it didn't. <laughs> because, because of his nature, because of that love nature, he said, I'm going to sacrifice, or I'm going to, not sacrifice, i got to get that out of my, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show him my love through the way I'm going to act, or this act of love, and I'm going to provide a way, and through Jesus and by Jesus, I'm going to provide a way. All you have to do is accept this act of love. Believe it. Okay? So, if you came to this church to get beat up, you're not going to get beat up. Okay, there's plenty of other churches that does that. We don't do that here. But we want you to leave out of here free, knowing that, listen, God, I don't owe God anything. 
God does not condemn us. He's not putting all this pressure on us to perform because now you owe him something. Okay? There's no small print. I mean, I read that, I read that scripture that I don't see small print there. You know, you all know what the small print does, right? Uh, when I was, uh, was doing uh, financial coaching, a lot of my clients, I taught them how to read the small print because that's where a lot of people get in trouble. They don't read the small sprint and uh, the small print. So I always told them like uh, the devil's in the details on the small print. So uh, you know, but there's no God's God God's act of love does not come with conditions or with you know small print for you to read and say you know like. But what is really hidden hidden in that message? There's nothing you know. God is just pure love, and His His uh, His act of love it's eternal. Once you receive that act of love and Jesus comes to reside on the inside of you, there's nothing you need to do. When I say do, that doesn't mean you don't have to, you know, you, please don't stay home next, next Sunday. Come to church because I want you to come to church. Okay, do read the Bible, do pray, do worship, you know. That's not what we're saying. But, you know, it's not, in order, to, you don't have to do anything to get God to move or to get closer to you or you do to get closer to God. Everything's already done. And you heard me say that if you can imagine this infinite warehouse with these infinite shelves that, you know, like they go for eternity and everything you'll ever need, it's on those shelves. It's in our warehouse. Everything's, when Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. If you feel like you need to do anything, what you're implying is like, yes, it is finished, but I have to add something to it. You don't have to add anything. Jesus said it was finished. It was finished. And the reason he, we picked that, that phrase or that word, because back in those days when you paid off a contract or you paid off a debt to somebody, you put it is finished. And that was just as any seal or anything that, you know, you can, it was a strong, that was during us Roman times. So when Jesus said it was finished, Get it out of your head that you have to do, add anything, please. Amen. Okay, don't, don't think you have to add anything because the minute you, you know, a little leaven, remember? A little leaven. If you think you have to add just a little bit to clarify something, you're saying that, you know, Jesus, yes, you finished it, but you missed a little bit. Just something I need to add, something I need to do. You know, and as you know, Arthur says, that's a bunch of... Do do. So, <laughs> so you know, no doo doos. Okay. <laughs> now, again, here at the Oasis of Light, we're not saying the sin, you know, it's good. Sin kills. Sin brings death. All right. So don't sin. Andrew says you'll be stupid to sin. <laughs> you know. So a sin, it's not good. But sin separates your way of looking at God. It does not affect God once whatsoever. It just makes you, so it becomes an issue between you and God, not between God and you. You know, because if you still have a guilty conscience or if, you're not, if you didn't truly accept this, this uh, uh, act of love, embraced it, and if there's any self-righteousness left, okay, then the minute you make a mistake, you're going to feel guilty. It's just an automatic response of the, the, the flesh. Okay? But when you truly believe with all your heart and accept this act of love, and you are restored to the image and likeness, there's zero guilt. Okay? And again, please don't misunderstand me. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'll go slap your brother and then turn and walk away. Don't even say sorry. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? But what I'm talking about when in relation to God, and, and here's another thing, is even if you, if you sin against your brother, and hopefully nobody's going to do it on purpose, but you know, by mistake, you've, you've done or said something, ask for forgiveness immediately. That's the, just a grown-up thing to do. Amen. And, you know, and that, excuse me, that applies, you know, even people out there. Uh, even if non, non-Christians <laughs> really believe that. So, how much more, as Christians, you know, we just ask forgiveness, and uh, if they don't forgive you, let them deal with those. 
You know, but if you don't, if you don't forgive, what are you going to do with all that sin that you take it upon yourself? So God's act of love is what the uh, theme of the New Testament is because that's what motivated God to provide a way through Jesus. Um, so let me get back to what I left last time. I was talking about how brain, our brain is a honing device. Okay? Our brain is wired to seek perfection, to seek joy, peace. Uh, and when we resist that, our body is fighting us, believe it or not. That's why a lot of people are sick because your brain is like, you know, I know there's a God that loves me uh, and I, I need this, this acceptance, this love. I need to be embraced. But the flesh sometimes says, you know what? That's not true. I don't believe it. So there's a conflict that happens between the way you're wired and the way you believe through a preaching or a teaching with somebody you grew up in a certain way and you believe that God is this God and then that reflects in your life and there's, there's a conflict between your body and your brain or the way you're wired, the way you, do, you know, remember divine by design? So, uh, so we talked about how what you see, what you hear, what you listen to, what you meditate on, it affects your, your brain and then your body. And a lot of people are sick because they believe a certain truth or a lie about God. Okay? So your view of God, the way you see God, dictates how you live your life and how you, your body reacts in this. Because, you know, this is the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit lives in a whole perfect body, right? Now, some people, you know, may say, well, <laughs> I'm, I got pain, you know, this. There's somewhere you believe the lie about something or about God. So... You divine by design, God made you in one way, image and likeness, but then we, we bought into a lie, and usually we're programmed as young kids to believe, you know, like the way I was programmed, I believe that, you know, if I go to movies, God's going to kill me or is going to smite me. So the more my parents says, don't go to movies, the more I wanted to go to movies. Okay? The more they say don't smoke, the more I wanted to smoke. Okay, I was being programmed to believe something, but the sad part about it is that they said that, you know, if you smoke, then God doesn't love you, or you're going to upset God to the point that he knows he's going to forget about you. No wonder you're going through all these things in life, because, you know, and I'm telling you, these are, these are spins the religion has put on the true gospel to mess people up, and I'm telling you, Satan lo loves nothing more than confusion. How many believe that? Okay? When you're confused, that's where you know he comes with more lies and more lies. And I'm telling you, he wraps them so beautifully. And, you know, when a, a dressed, well-dressed pastor, you know, stay, you know, stands in front of people and they, they preach. And I'm telling you, a lot of them are sincerely wrong. But they're sincere in what they're teaching. You know? And then people's like, the more you listen to them, the more you believe that. Because you know what? Well, it says in the Bible. Well, how do you read the Bible? Also, it's important. I mean, you could read it as a book or a historical book, or you could read it as the Word of God, being, you know, this is life. This is truth. And it does affect your, your, your life. It, it impacts your life. So those programs are put inside of us as young kids and then we grow up and then we develop this image of who God is based on what we were told or you know the teaching we received and then all of a sudden your relationship okay a horizontal relationship it's being affected things are not working but it said but you know what? I pray three times a day why things are not working out but I study the Bible I read I read the Bible cover to cover ten times that's pretty impressive I haven't done it yet I mean, I read the Bible, but I didn't read it cover to cover intentionally to say I read the Bible cover to cover because I wanted to. Okay, I asked the Holy Spirit because this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when I need revelation, this is what I go. Okay, this is what I get my revelation, you know, through what I get my revelation through. So 
those programs that we've, we've allowed ourselves to taint the image of God, okay? Now, we live out of that, that uh, place, and all of a sudden we experience problems in life, whether it's sickness, whether it's uh, things are not working out, and then you're sitting there and people blame God. And the funny thing is they blame God whether it's good or it's bad. And then Satan gets a pass. Okay? Now, I may make some statements that are pretty radical, but it, you know, don't, don't hold it against me. Um, Pastor John is my teacher. <laughs> but I'm willing to go as far as to say that, you know, organized religion is probably invented by the devil. That's a pretty harsh statement. Okay? But hear me what I say. Okay? I'm not saying the people that go to church and there's big churches. I'm not saying that. But when people use religion to manipulate people and distort the image of God or the nature of God, that's not of God. There is not. You know, people, if I manipulate somebody to get something out of that person using the scripture, that's not God. And you could. I can, I can, I can make a pretty compelling argument compel, you know, with, with the scripture. And I can make you believe a certain thing, and especially when it comes from somebody in authority, that he knows it's called by God. So we need to be real careful when we use scripture, you know, if it does not align with nature of God, the likeness of God. I'm sorry, I mean, you could use it as a historical fact, you know, the scripture, but don't use it, you know, that, that you know, you should live life based on this because this is what the scripture says. Because I've been told that all my life, up until I met Pastor John and, you know, started coming to the Oasis of Light and got into Karis Public College and listened to Andrew. You know, I, I believed a bunch of lies. And it impacted my life in a negative way, not a positive way. I mean, to the point that I became angry at people, and specifically people that go to church. That's pretty sad. I mean, people that were out there in the world, I didn't, I didn't, didn't bother me. But people that went to church that I grew up in, I wanted to hurt physically. Because they robbed me of something. I mean, that's how I felt. And I kept telling my wife, I said, listen, if that's not God, the way they present God, that's not God. I just know it on the inside of me. I just, I need somebody to explain it to me. And it took years and years until I've heard of Andrew O'Mac, you know, and Pastor John and the Oasis, you know, to, to kind of be exposed to this truth and reality. Now you may ask, you know, why didn't you ask the Holy Spirit? Well, I wasn't, I didn't receive the speaking in tongues, the actually the baptism of the Holy Spirit until 2007. But I grew up in a Pentecostal church, right? And that was a must. You, you ha that was your ticket to heaven. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you go to hell. And you know what? When, when I went and the way they asked, you know, to receive the Holy Spirit, again, I told my wife, like, this cannot be. I can't, I can't I, this, is not, this is not right. If it's a gift, how do I have to, why do I have to work so hard for it? Why do I have to, you know, sweat and, you know, get all tired, three hours on my knees of yelling and asking and begging and begging, you know, and I didn't get it. And again, went back to the vicious cycle. He says, like, well, I must have, I've done all these bad things. What am I expecting? Right? <laughs> Do you see how, how religion has manipulated mankind over the years? We all know that, you know, people kill in the name of religion, name of God. Okay? Uh, people justify horrible things in the name of God. Religion. So what I want you to take away this morning here is that, you know, the nature of God is love. And his whole um, purpose with humanity was to restore us back to the image and likeness. And not through manipulation, not through punishment, not through all this stuff that, you know, we look at the, uh, somebody asked me, I don't know who asked me, you know, well, how do you, how do you explain then that God killed so many people in the Old Testament if God is love? That God really killed them. 
No, I don't think he did. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to present a scenario, scenario to you here. If, if you have 10 kids, the five older kids are so wicked and so bad that they're doing horrible things to the five younger kids. And these five younger kids don't have the opportunity to, to, to grow up normal and to, to have a chance to life. Would you put the five older ones to sleep to allow the five young ones to grow up? Would you do that? I would. Right? If you look at Jesus, whenever Jesus talked about anybody dying in the New Testament, he said what? They are sleeping or they're asleep. Okay? Again, we're thinking from our perspective as humans. We don't look at from God's perspective. And he say, you know what? You're not really dying when you're dying. I mean, you leave this body, but you're not really dead. You live for eternity. Right? So that's how God looks at us. He's not looking at it like, you know what, you're dying. You're just sleeping. You know, we're all going to wake up, right? The Bible talks about we're all going to get new glorified bodies, right? So that implies that God never really killed anybody, in my opinion. Now, that's my explanation of that. And believe it or not, lately, that's been the number one question in school, Bible college, the Bible college, uh, as I minister to people out there, soldiers, veterans, they're all always like, well, if God is God of love, why did he kill so many people? And you need to know how to answer that, and this is the way I answer it. I mean, if you get a different answer that supports this, you know, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. There's probably more than one way to explain this. But in my opinion, what Jesus wouldn't refer to people being dead to are our understanding as asleep. You know, Lazarus was asleep, right? You know, Tabitha, the young lady, you know, young girl was asleep. You never refer to them as like they're dead. Only time is like you have to explain to the, you know, uh, disciples, you know, like, well, if he's, if he's asleep, let him sleep. I mean, let him rest. Your knucklehead. <laughs> Physically, he's dead, but he's asleep. <laughs> so, your brain, it's a honing device. Okay? So when you respond to fear, which humans try to manipulate people through fear, if you look at the, uh, uh, the news and you know, elections, everything's based on fear. They want you to act based on fear. There's, there's no other motivation. Whether you know, it's drugs, whether they sell clothes, whether it's like, you know, there's something you need, even if you don't need it. But as you know, you need it because otherwise you couldn't live without it. Okay? So motivation is fear. So your brain... If, if you're given to that fear, will produce, okay, the hypothalamus will produce the right cocktails and conflict with, with the, you know, what the word says, you know, who you are, will produce the right cocktail to fight you on it, and people end up sick. People end up, you know, with anxiety, depression, you name it, all these kind of problems because they operate based on fear, okay? They don't understand that if God said that you are restored for eternity, John 3, 16, the way you read it, you are restored to the image and likeness for eternity. Once you embrace that, nobody can come and put fear in your mind or in your heart. Okay? Now, if you respond to love, the brain produces other cocktails that makes you all full of joy and happy and healing takes place in your body. Okay? So what you expose yourself to is important. This relationship affects this relationship. You know that, right? What you believe about God will impact how you live with others and in this, in this life here on earth. So it's really, really important to, uh, to, um, to understand the nature of God. And God is a God of restoration, not of God a, uh, a punitive damage or... Um, you know, he doesn't want, he didn't punish humanity, didn't punish Jesus, is not judging anyone. So, um, here, what I wanted to get to here, if you go to 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says that the core narrative of this gospel, the master story of God and Christ, it's all about reconciliation and rest restoration. 
And God's intention all along has been to restore. And let's go ahead and read uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19. All that verse, right? Can anybody quote that scripture? Yep. Now, how, does, how did that, because I want to get to the next scene. You know, I'm running out of time here. So sin, there was, there was sin, right? The men sin. God made Jesus a sin. And I'm trying to kind of, I'm against cliches, and there's a lot of myths out there about, you know, this, this whole transaction, if you will, you know, that God gave Jesus, sacrificed Jesus. Then, you know, next point is, well, why did, you know, how did God make Jesus sin? He knew no sin, but he made him sin, right? Depends how you define sin. Again, it's all a matter of perspective. You know, I mean, there's so many ways that the scripture talks about what sin is. Separation between God and us, and, you know, there's so many explanations that people give. What is really sin? In my book, what sin is, it's us not accepting this act of love, not believing that's the ultimate sin. And how many know that the only reason humanity or a person will go to hell is not because they've done anything horrible in this life. The only reason... People go to hell, and they're going to go, and I say, they'll go. They'll go by themselves. God is not going to throw anybody in, in hell. Remember, if you don't believe and accept this act of love, you're condemned already. It doesn't say that God throws anybody in hell or sends anybody to hell. We'll go there by themselves. Not me, but, you know, people that don't accept and believe in this act of love. They don't believe in Jesus. So a definition of sin is not believing in Jesus, not believing this act of love. God made Jesus a way to, for you to believe. Okay? So it's the positive and negative of believing or not believing. So by believing in Jesus and this act of love, remember Jesus and God are the same? You can't just separate and say, you know, like God gave his son, even though it says that. They all together provided this way and said, this is the way to salvation. This is the way to restoration. There's no other way. No one can come to the Father but exactly. There's no other way. I don't care what Oprah says. <laughs> she said it. Okay? So there's no other way but through Jesus, through believing this act of love. So when you know, you know, Bibles here says that uh, God made Jesus sin, who knew no sin, meaning God, Jesus was not capable. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no unbelief in Jesus. He knew no sin. Right? So Adam fell by believing a lie. Jesus came and provided himself as a way to believe in him and to undo what Adam did by not believe by believing. Does that make sense? <laughs> I know, I'm surprised myself a little bit. <laughs> um, so Jesus allowed to become this way. To believe in him, to believe in this way of uh, this act of love. Because Adam, by believing the wrong thing, has doomed the humanity... And God had to provide a way to restore his creation back to image and likeness. Okay, really, really important to remember this, that, you know, God wants us restored to the image, which you never lost. But we lost the likeness, and he wanted to complete the package. He says, this is how I created you to be, image and likeness. Because that's when you perform, that's when you operate at the highest level as a creation of God. And you're on, and you understand when God sells you something, you know immediately the spirit man knows things. Okay? And that's why you should rule your life, the spirit man, right? Not the flesh. Now, in the flesh, you would, you would live a victorious life once you understand that the likeness, the spirit man is in control. And like Jesus said, I don't do or say anything that I don't see or hear my father do. Same thing, the spirit man, us. We do what we see our father do. 
we say, what we hear our fathers say. That's why edifying each other is really, really important. Okay? So I could have started or my teaching with the way Pastor John says, did you come here to be encouraged? Yes. Hopefully you are encouraged. If you come here, you didn't come here to be condemned, right? And I hope nobody leaves here condemned because clearly John 3, 17 says that God did not send his son to condemn the world. Man, it's, I don't know if it gets any simpler than this. I don't know why we complicate things. We really do complicate things. I think we like things to be, I think it gives us importance when we complicate things. I don't know if you heard, you know, if you heard this said, you know, it takes an idiot to complicate things and it takes a genius to simplify them. That's true. I mean, I don't, I don't think it gets, you know, the, the gospel is so simple. Paul com clearly said, you know, that, you know, I'm here to preach the gospel and everybody will get it. Whether you're smart or not so smart, or whether you're Jew or, or a Gentile. Everybody should get this gospel. It's really, really, really simple. Okay? So if, if you came here to expect some sophisticated words, you're not going to get them here. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, we like to preach the good news. Amen. And that's, you know, we preach the good news, and that's when people want to accept the good news. They don't want bad news. And then when you talk about self-righteousness, a bunch of doo-doo, that's bad news. It is. I'm going to end with this, uh, with this funny, like Greg Moore says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it funny. You all heard about the atheist that decided one morning to go through the forest to admire Mother Nature's creation. So he was walking down this trail and looked at the trees and said, man, such a beautiful trees. The birds were chirping. He said, man, they sing so nice. And as he was walking and admiring butterflies and all these things, all of a sudden, the gris grizzly bear appears in front of him. So he didn't know what to do, and he looked up and said, God, please save me. And God said, and this is like, <laughs> you denied my existence all your life. You believe in a bunch of, you know, uh, random explosions of gases. You don't believe I created theirs. Why should I save you? It's a good point, God. Why don't you just make the bear Christian then? So God said, yes. So the bear puts his paws together and said, Father, I thank you about the meal I'm about to receive. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>